Hello, and welcome back to Zim Explore. I'm Dr. Abstract, and in this Zim Explore, we're going to continue to take a look at texture actives. And texture actives are a way that we can get Zim into the 3JS world. Let's go in and take a look at Zim now at zimjs.com. Ah, here's a banner for texture actives right here. And we've already taken a look at how to get a puzzle. That's a Zim puzzle on a model. So if you want to get to the Zim Explorers, oh, well, not the Zim Explorers, the texture actives, uh, if you see this, you can go there, but it's not the only banner. It's also under what's new. It's under Zim 015, but who knows when you're seeing this video. So the official way would be in the code section here. There, well, you could also look at it under examples. There's a bunch of them there. But in the code section, we have libraries, and the libraries help us with sockets and physics. And here's 3JS, so we've got game module and a few other things, bringing data in, etc. Uh, we often, uh, in the past, had brought 3JS into Zim, and so this is us controlling 3D or 3JS with Zim components, etc. Uh, but here we have flipped it and now we're able to get Zim into 3JS. So here are the examples that we currently have, uh, the launch examples that we've, we've done. And we've done bubbling videos uh, that take you through the first three here. And then another bubbling video that takes you through these three. And then a bubbling video that takes you through the code of that one. So that would be a good introduction to all of this if you're coming in from 3JS. Or indeed, if you're coming from Zim and haven't seen those videos, you should probably look for the bubbling videos first. The Explore videos are longer, and we've done an Explore on this one specifically, uh, where we look through all the code to do the first-person version of this, where we had interactive cylinders uh, or t materials on the cylinders. So if you're coming from the three world, you might be used to ray casting and finding out which object you're pressing on and do something with it. Uh, 3JS is kind of, it's kind of like a, it's not always totally interactive. It, often we've just got a, the orbit controls, we're kind of looking at stuff. Um, on the other hand, the, can, the canvas, the 2D canvas, is very interactive, uh, unless you're doing just generative art stuff, but most of the games and puzzles and e-learning apps and things that we make on the canvas are highly interactive with lots of dragging and dropping and selecting and components, and, and that's what Zim is good for. And now we're going to see Zim inside of 3JS, but on the textures, so they can be on any material, which is, which is great. We also did a an explore video on this to find out how we put a puzzle on on this model right here in the 3d world and we saw how to put physics another explore video on how to put physics on the on, a, on the uh, material there on the texture of the material so great you're welcome to take a look at those and maybe you have and now we've got a couple left in our initial series here this one and they're they're both quite similar as a matter of fact we did a hud so this is a hud here and this is the one we're going to be looking at today but then we thought this hud also had some complexities in it first of all it wasn't just the hud we were also using texture actives inside um, inside as well and animating this with noise and we involved a synth and so it had all these extra things and so we thought we would drop back and make another simpler hud example so that's this last one that will do the uh, basic HUD right here, where we just have a model in there. Well, it's not even a model. It's um, <laughs> whatever that is, Some spinning torus thingy. It, it just comes with uh, three JS. Um, it's a geometry. And then we've got a HUD in the backing or in, in the foreground here. And the HUD is controlling things about that, changing the speed of it, the color of it, and, and other things in the placement of it. So this was your standard HUD example, and we'll do an explore of that uh, last with respect to these initial examples. Okay, so here it is. We're doing this one. Uh, this is probably our mo most complex one with the most parts. So therefore, this explore might take the longest. However, on the other explorers, we've kind of gone off on tangents and looked at Zim to try and help, uh, in, you know, you understand what's available in Zim to be able to use on these textures. Maybe in this case, we won't do that quite as much. We'll try and avoid tangents and stick with the, the current code here. Does that sound good? 
so this is in 3D, and what we can do is press on, so you see this? This is a texture that is interactive. You could probably do something like that right in 3JS, but I think you'll find that this might be easier. And it also allows us to do some things that perhaps um, you couldn't normally do. But isn't that cool? Look at that. And, and you might be wondering, well, what are these things doing? Let's, uh, let's have a listen. So we're going to turn on the sound here. So in comes the sound. If we go closer, it gets a little louder as well. Nice, huh? And we can also make it do this. And also different sounds. <laughs> okay. Farther away. Okay, back to the organ, huh? And down here, oh, we've got to show you these things. Maybe it'd be fun with the buzzies. That's slower, faster. So these things are fast. That's the speed of it. And this is how bumpy it is. Okay, that's enough buzzing, huh? So that's using the synthesizer with a wah on it. Alrighty. Um, let's see, and what's happening is the amount of the wah is, is only on the ones that are selected. So you're getting a wah uh, as this one goes up and down, and a wah as that one's going up and down. And these are called components. That's a dial, and here's a slider. And down here you have a couple check boxes. And this is called a selector up here. The selector you can uh, click on to and it goes through. You can also click and kind of hold up and down like that. And if you have a lot of things to select, that selects. It can do numbers, but it can also do strings as we get there. Oh, and a HUD check right here. So if we check HUD, they all go away and they all come back. As well, uh, we can see these components in action. So if I hit the T key, here is Zim. So this is what we built in Zim. Zim, we make a texture active object. So this thing is a texture active object. This thing is a texture active object because they're in different places. This is as well. And then we can scrub through those texture active objects. There's the actual synth. And, and these things are live. So if we turn the sound on. Oh, uh, and let's choose not the cosmic. There we go. And now we can play. You see that? There's the other one. Let's turn the sound off. You can also use this, this thing to scrub through them as well. And you can close it with that or with the T. And those are live, so this is the current state. If we bring, say, both of these boxes back, let's hit the T again. Come back here and say, hey, go to the end. And this one go to the end as well. When we go back, they're both at the end. If we put them all over here, and we that's a the zim selector and go back to t now they're right at the end here and right at the end there so it's a live situation we also made this toggle right here so it toggles back and forth and I'll slow that down a bit the organ itself is going through the zim noise equation so that's kind of exciting so we've got that in there and we make a lot of generative art using noise and um, you can see that in the zim world under the examples in the zim world let's go into the code and see how we put this together we've got two texture actives one texture active is for texture actives plural is for the hud so the hud's got its own ortho camera 
So that means it uh, only takes two dimensions, and we're and this is uh, what it looks like flat on here. Okay, and we've also got a perspective camera, which also has a texture actives, which handle these two um, texture active objects here, this one and the bottom one. The trick here, though, is that when you put a texture active, so this is the texture active is on this whole thing. It's a, just a big, long se selector, it's called. But unfortunately, on the back of it, on the back of a, a cube or a, what is it called, the box geometry, it flips it. So without doing anything, unfortunately, if the front was here, the back would be over here and, and vice versa. So uh, that was kind of unfortunate, which means we've got to put a different um, texture on or is it a different material? So a different material on each side of the cube. And the, they're all the same, except the back of the cube gets a flipped material. And that worked. We nearly left it off, like we just took it off, and then you could only have the box on the front. But uh, with a, just a little bit of work, we managed to make it um, handle that. Okay. Now let's go to the code. Keep on teasing the code. We're going, yeah, let's go to the code. Let's go to the code now. How about now? Should we go to the code? Okay, we drop that down. We're in the code. All right. This is where you want to be when we're exploring, isn't it? So we're using Zim015 here. And we're bringing in Zim3. And uh, normally we would just bring in Zim, but if you want to bring in uh, 3JS as well, uh, which is 3JS R155 currently, which is the latest version. And, or you can do your own. So we have examples as well called raw. There's a raw basic one right there where we bring in our own 3JS and orbit controls, or you can do that however you want. And at which point you would just import Zim like so, just normal Zim. But I think you'll find that our helper library is also quite helpful. And, you know, maybe you'll like how that works as well. So you can do that. There's also a raw version of the HUD as well. So HUD and HUD raw. We haven't, we're going to look at the HUD in the next Explore. We're starting a new frame. And once again, if you haven't used Zim before, then hopefully you'll find Zim's pretty easy to look at. I, th I think you will. But there's lots of ways to learn Zim. You go to the Zim site, hit the Learn module, and look at the, or hit the Learn page, and then choose the Zim Basics. All right, I did say that we wouldn't go on too many tangents, but let just, let's just show you that quickly. So here's the Zim site. If you hit Learn, and scroll down, you can learn from the editor. The editor has all these zaps right here. There's a start zap and you can try it that way and it kind of takes guides you along there. But also under the videos is Zim Basics right here and that's a good way to start in on the world of Zim. But here's the frame. And here are uh, some JSON files which are for those sounds for the organ and ethnic. The buzzy uh, wasn't needed. The buzzy is just a, a built-in sound. And that came from our waves. We have a, I don't know, there's maybe 60 different wave sounds that you can choose from in there. We, when we're ready, when that stuff is loaded, here is some excellent instructions uh, that everybody who's using Texture Active should read through all of that. But to a certain degree, that's what we're talking about now. So uh, we won't read through it now. Here's the Zim side where we're bringing it, just give you a quick overview of the code and us <laughs> a quick overview of the code. Uh, we have the logo up in the top. It's got a little checkbox. It's going to remove the HUD as well. Ooh, it looks like we're styling. Like I said, quick overview here. We've got a slider. We've got a dial. We've got the synth stuff. So this is in Zim. We've got the synth stuff. We have a toggle that's going to uh, toggle the sound, I guess, probably. Oh, what is this? This is the top. So here's the stuff on the top. All that was the stuff on the bottom, I guess. So here's the top stuff. We have the texture active for um, the organ stuff, looks like. 
when we change it, we're changing the type, and that's a stepper. Yeah, that's for the, the uh, sound, different types of sounds. And here's the cylinder stuff. So somewhere there was probably a logo in there that I didn't quite see, but it's, oh, it's up there somewhere. Uh, that was where, but where we had the checkbox that would turn the HUD on, on and off. Okay. Here's the work on the cylinders. So the cylinders have those selectors. So that's the first selector. Here is the second selector somewhere. That's a tile. Do you see a second selector? We're tiling. Um, that's the tile. Is it for the selectors? I don't know. Tile one, tile two. There's another selector. Here's a selector. Selector one, selector two. Oh, okay. So that was just the um, texture active for it. And that's, in other words, the texture active is the container or the Zim page that's going to hold the selector components. <laughs> so it's confusing me. It's called selector one, but it's really just the texture actives. Then we actually put a selector in there, and that's right here. New selector, and here's a second selector. So those are those two strips of interfaces. Once again, we'll come back through this. We haven't, haven't looked through it. We're just getting an overview here of all the things that are here. Here's the three JS side. So we just did the Zim side. In other words, what we were looking at there would be this. We made that logo right there with the checkbox. Here's the, this is up in the top right. That was our um, stepper. Then this was at the bottom, the dial and the slider. There's the select or the uh, toggles at the bottom right. And these things are the selectors, two of them. Okay, those are that's what we just made in Zim. And there's the one selector here and a second selector here. And there's all this stuff around the outside. Then in 3JS, here we are in 3JS. We are using our Zim 3 class right here to help us make the scene, the camera, and the render. That does all your scene, camera, and render stuff. And if you take a look at the raw versions over here, the... Uh, texture active raw. That's the very first texture active that we did. We've got a raw version of that, and we have a raw version of the first person controllers or the HUD, sorry, right here. And uh, if it were the raw version that we were looking at, then oh, we'd be doing, I don't know, three times as much code in here, maybe more, okay, to get our scene, camera, and render. This is for the HUD. We're setting up a, an ortho, ortho scene. Oh, uh, when we passed in ortho true there. Oh, so it even it's going to save us more because then we don't also don't have to set up the ortho camera and the ortho, ortho scene. Okay, so that's passing ortho true and it also passes texture active true into the three helper module. That gives us all this stuff. Nice and easy. We're having a skybox that we add to the scene. We have the controls, which are the orbit controls and those come with our when we imported zim underscore three orbit controls also come with that so do first person controls and the gltf loader those those three things are so small just a you know not even a k something like that anyway and um, it's just more convenient to bundle it all together rather than to even have to think about it as far as i'm concerned and here we've got the two texture actives then. We are taking an overview here, so why don't we just do it quickly. We've got a couple texture actives, one for the ortho and one for the, um, the perspective things. We're adding some lights. We've got uh, the logo is on a panel. A lot of this stuff is on the panel. The slider's on a panel. So this is a helper um, method that will help us do basically these kind of steps right there, but we don't have to do all that. It's kind of done internally for us. All right, so that, that's that's for the HUD stuff. Here's the cylinder work. So we also have the cylinder work where we're looping through and we're making a bunch of cylinders for this. And then we're putting the pickers on. So this is, uh, I guess the pickers are the, which is actually a selector is that little box that goes along that and we've got this is where we have to break it up into the material for all the sides of the cube and there's the back flipped side of the cube okay and once again we'll we'll go over this we're just taking an overview at the moment 
We've got two pickers. There's the first picker. Here's the second picker using this stuff. Try to do some reusing. And then here's the noise that is causing those to go up and down. So that's what's causing those pickers to, to or sorry, not the pickers, but the cylinders to move like this is the noise equations. And a little bit of a throttle, just in case your device is really slow, we drop it down to 30 frames per second, but hopefully that doesn't happen much anymore. All right, so there you go. Are you ready? Deep breath. Here we go. Okay, so all the way back up to the top. Bum, bum, bum. We have our logo texture active, setting its background to clear. If we didn't set it clear and set it instead to red, Here's what it would look like. Uh, this is the actual real version. So right click and say, open in browser. And there it is. Okay, so up there. There's what the texture active looks like and it's holding our logo and our little checkbox for the HUD. And indeed, if we hit T, there you can see it uh, right there. Let's have a look. So by default, we, we are given a corner. If we didn't want that corner to be there, we could take off the corner, but anyway, we want clear so that we don't see the background. That's the width and the height. Then we're using a static method right on the texture active class called make logo. You probably won't need to make that logo very often. That was for us to, did I save that other one? That was just to, uh, for us to have something that's kind of exciting to look at as we launch the product. Uh, but of course, you're welcome to use it if you want. Um, we're making it interactive. And th therefore, when we tap on it here, we're calling texture actives manager dot toggle. Texture actives is what whole, keeps track of all of our texture active materials. And we've got a manager. So as soon as there's more than one texture active, each one will get that same manager. The manager manages all of those texture actives objects because you need a different texture actives object for each camera because the ray casting is looking at it from the camera position. Okay. And uh, we're telling it to toggle. So every time we click the logo, it's just going to either go on or off. And that's what's giving us this. We press or tap on the logo, it comes to here. We tap on the logo, it goes back again. This would be done as you're editing or developing. It might be done for educational purposes or demonstration purposes, but for a final product, if we were to launch this to the world, we would probably turn that off and not make it do this. This is a little bit odd for, for people. It would be almost like a, a backdoor or a way to cheat so that you can go to anywhere you want in your, in your 3D world and just start interacting with it kind of in a way that maybe wasn't intended. <laughs> Okay, so that's, um, but that is very nice for you as you're developing this, that you have a way to see what's happening on the Zim side. Speaking of which, as you're developing this, you might just want to work in Zim to start to get all of your textures built before you even see it in 3D. And that's, that's sort of what we did, at which point we wouldn't have any of the 3D. And you see this texture active right here? you might want to add that to the stage, add to. Right now, it's not added to the stage anywhere. That means if you were trying to build it uh, without the 3JS stuff, you wouldn't see it. So in Zim, we make display objects. This is a display object that extends a page, a Zim page, which extends a Zim container. And that means it's a display object and we can see it on the stage, but you've got to add it to the stage or center it on the stage or position it on the stage or loc it on the stage. Those are different ways that we have to place something on the stage. We probably did that as we were building and then when we didn't need it anymore, we just took it off. The reason we don't really need it anymore is when you add those texture active objects to texture actives, plural, texture actives will automatically tile these objects as we go. You see how they're tiled um, from left to right. Okay, so this thing is called the stage, this gray box that we're looking at, and texture actives will tile it. As a matter of fact, it specifically doesn't tile it, the manager tiles it. And so that allows each texture actives, 
object. It might have, say, five things in it, and the other one's got three things in it. Well, we don't want to tile them on top of each other. We don't want the first texture active to tile it here, and the second one to tile it in the same place, because then our clicks, when we raycast, our clicks would bump into each other. So that's why we needed a manager. The manager then will take all of them, any, any of them, and tile it uh, along there. So this is the this is the non-ortho. It looks like we made the ortho first. So here's the stuff from the ortho camera. And really the only difference is it, it doesn't make much difference. We normally probably would have done the ortho second, but we like the looks. Like when you come in here, it's sort of more exciting to see these things first. So that's why we switch the order down here. I'm just scrolling down. And there's our texture actives. You see how we we could switch this. Let's do it this way. So now we put the texture actives for the perspective camera first and the texture actives for the ortho second. And let's see what happens when we refresh here. We shouldn't see any changes, so that's fine. And all of this stuff will work. There I am interacting with that. And here I am interacting with these guys. We Okay, and if we hit the T key, now we're seeing the uh, the perspective camera first, and there's the ortho being tiled next. All right, so if you're working on a second part and are annoyed at keep on scrolling over here to get to the second part, you're always welcome to just swap your the one that you're working on, put it first, and that way, when you run it here, when you run it here, refresh and hit the T key to check it out, you got what you're working on is right in front of you. Okay, so you can avoid the scrolling. Uh, I think you'll notice as well that if I scroll way over to here, hit the T key, and then hit the T key again, it stays to where you last scrolled. So that, you know, maybe isn't, that, that, that's probably good. In the future, we were kind of thinking if there is a way to do this, but if there's a way to say I work on the organ here, and then hit the T key, it kind of be nice. Well, in this case, <laughs> it is showing the organ. But um, if I were over here and hit the T key and I'm working on the organ, yeah, I'm working on the organ, I hit the T key, it's not on the organ. So it'd be kind of neat to, if it's focused, to make sure that when you tab on over to here, you're, you've got it in focus. That currently isn't running. I don't know if we totally need it, but um, time will tell. And as, as more people work on this, it may become a request or it may be obvious as we start working on projects that that would be more efficient. So if you do have any requests like that, you're welcome to join us at Zim uh, up in here. Uh, here's the Zim site or on any, any of the banners. You've got Discord and Slack and that's those are our channels where we communicate. And please don't be shy. So join us. Talk to us. Why not? All this stuff is free, fun, and friendly. We've got really, really nice people who have been working in the Zim environment for almost 10 years now. We would love to have some more people there. Uh, you know, the more community, the better. So come on in. I'm Dr. Abstract there. Okay. So where'd we get to? We were still up above here, weren't we? You're looking at all this code and going, oh my god, we're on the first line. We talked about this line right here. Uh, yeah, okay, so we have checkbox. It's, after all, this is called a Zim Explore. And usually these are a little bit longer, like an hour, hour and a half. So you're always welcome to go get a cookie or some licorice and come on back and listen to the rest of it. Part two, yeah. I hope that you like watching these videos, even more than, say, watching Netflix or something. It's like, oh, how exciting. And we hope we can make it exciting for you. If you have any suggestions such as stop talking, stop talking to me, get get to the point, come on. All right, fine, on, let's get to the point then. Here's a Zim checkbox. We are saying what the label is, the color, the right to left. Why do we do that? That just uh, flipped the HUD on. I suppose normally a checkbox has the word. Uh, the checkbox usually has a word on the right hand side, but with the design here, we've gone to the right to left, which would have, which would flip that. Uh, we have a lot of, well, our, our biggest users, I guess, are in Israel, and they're right to left. So that has helped us a lot. Have um, you know, Hebrew in the 
and the interfaces and <laughs> all is great. <laughs> One thing, of course, being in North America here, it's a bit harder to market with your biggest, <laughs> your biggest client, so to speak. Uh, not quite using the same language. Uh, but they're also hitting the states with this thing called, let's see, what was that called? Clap Lab, which is exciting. So they've made hundreds of apps in Zim, and that's all very exciting. But that uh, does mean that we're paying attention to right to left, which is nice. Start Check True. These things, by the way, we're using an object literal right there, but you can also set parameters. See, there's some parameters in normal, and with Zim, we can do in either. So I think actually these might even be the first three parameters of a texture active. Let's go take a look. So going out to Zim, hit the docs, hit texture. And here's texture active right here with height and color. So yeah, we don't even need to use the Zim Duo technique there. It would be faster if we just did this. But maybe we thought we were going to something else as well. Okay, do you like? So we can do either of those things. And if we test here, that's the original. We don't need that anymore. Here's the, the new one. And we hit fresh, refresh. Uh, that all still works there. Okay, so that's called the Zim Duo technique. And most of, most of our uh, methods and classes use Zim Duo. If you look in the docs here, so here's the docs for that. And we come on down to the parameters. Parameters, supports duo, parameters and single object, uh, or sorry, parameters, or single object with properties that match below. It also selects or supports oct, which means that it supports CSS like style. So that means we could style this by going style is equal to, and in there we could have said width of 400, etc. And then we would need the width here, undefined, or indeed null, or whatever. We could have put all three of these things up inside a style and put absolutely nothing here. All right, and then anything after this style is made, anything after that has a width and height would, would um, get those. Or we could even specifically say, no, 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 not everything, but only the texture active objects will get these styles. I, I, I can do it. There we go, that would go in here, and then any styles that we want to apply specifically to texture active objects would go there. And we can also specify that this thing is a group, colon, oh, uh, not quite, squiggly brackets around that, group um, big or something. Okay, that's like a class. So now this texture active is group big, at which point we would say group here. And this is basically saying any anything with a, uh, a <laughs> sorry, not group, uh, big. Anything with a group of big would get, would be 400. Okay, so that's very much like CSS. And we've got a lot that we can do with styles that is really, really exciting. Uh, basically any property can be styled, but that can also handle these things called zoom V values, which are dynamic parameters, like a series of things. Uh, we could do a series and have, hey, a series of widths like this. Series, 400 comma 200 or 300, whatever, <laughs> whatever written there. That would mean the first thing that gets made is 400. The next thing that gets made is 300. The next thing that gets made is four, back to 400 and then back to 300. And series can do all sorts of flips and you know, whatever. So, so exciting stuff. And not only that, but you could put in an array here. Oh, I did say we weren't going to do too much of this. Uh, right, we better get back to the code, huh? But that would randomly pick between 400 and 300 just randomly every time we do it. So we got lots of things on the go. But we got nothing. Uh, we don't need any of this right now. I can't remember what the widths and heights were, so I'm gonna have to undo. Uh, was that right? Does that look right? Looks about right, huh? Okay, so there we go. Um, we're scaling it to the logo 100%. So this is the texture active make logo. We're scaling it to the size of the logo, 100% in the width, 100% in the height, whichever one um, fits in there. There's different ways that we can do that too. If we said uh, there's fill, there's fit, 
and there's full. Okay, those are different options on doing that that do different things with your scaling. We're positioning at zero, zero in the center at the top of the logo. So that's just how we wanted that one. And then we're, um, when we tap that, we swap it, good. The checkbox, we got a bunch of stuff there. We're scaling it a little bit smaller. We're positioning it at the bottom left or at the left bottom or five from the left and the bottom pose positions things nicely around the edges of stuff, very handy. And when that thing changes, we're calling this arrow function. If the checkbox is checked, then we're going to, um, which checkbox is this? So, oh, right, so we're either removing the HUD or we're adding the HUD to the, the ortho scene. So we've made a scene ortho down below and we're going to add the HUD or remove the HUD based on whether the checkbox is checked. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense to you if you happen to read that again. Oh, here we are applying some style specifically to texture active objects. What do you know? Where we're setting the, the color to pink and the second color that's uh, that makes a gradient. And there's the angle of our gradient going down. Normally the gradient goes from left to right, I guess. And so that's an angle going down. We're putting a border color and a border width on this. This sort of matters to us now because I guess we have a special panel. Accent size, accent, oh, this is some accent stuff that will be used for, I don't know, whatever, the slider. All right, yeah, so we're styling the sliders, although we didn't specifically say a slider, but nothing else really has accent size. Well, dials do. Actually, oh, look, there we go. We're probably using that for both the slider and the dial. There's a slider, and here's a dial. So that's why we've stuck the um, that up there. If we didn't have this, here's what it looks like. So I'm going to comment that out and we'll take a look if we can find it. Uh, that's it. So here it is. These are the accents. I haven't refreshed yet, but you see the little pink and the blue, pink and blue. Now I'm going to do the refresh. I did not do a refresh. I did a find, uh, control R. And now we don't have the accent. So the accent is missing there. It's a pretty stylized slider and dial. Well, the, this one's got an Aztec uh, look to it, or button. Otherwise, it's pretty simple. That's that's weird looking. That's not usually what our dials look like. But look at the panels. There's the panel work with the one, the, the, the border. And there's, look at the shading. You see on that? Oh, I see. So we've got, normally on a page, I think we made it so by default, it goes from the top to the bottom. That makes most sense for a page. Here it looks like we may have done it from the right to the left. I can't see because what, what's our difference? We're doing pink and purple with two alphas, like a faint pink and purple. If we take off the alpha on that, what does it look like? Refresh here. We'll probably see the gradient a bit better. Uh, it is from the top to the bottom. So maybe a page, I don't know. I can't remember which way the default gradient goes. It looks like it is going from the top to the bottom. Maybe we could see that even more if it weren't purple, but rather blue. Anyway, no big deal. Just a gradient setting. Okay. What do you think? Do you like? It's not bad. Maybe that with the alpha back again. Anyway, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah. Uh, we can, to any color, say to alpha, and that reduces its alpha. You can also use quote RGBA to get alpha or hue saturation or whatever as well. I don't know if that has an alpha though. Um, you could, uh, we could set the backings alpha later. So there's a variety of ways, but you can also say to color there and it would change this color towards another color by a ratio. And you can also say lighten here and darken here. So those are handy things on any colors inside a Zim. Uh, I think that's how it was, that's good. And we want to bring back the accents anyway. So there we are bringing back the accent styles. Here is the new texture active. We are saying backing orbit false. We just found that if this were the default, so I'll comment that out. If the, the default is that the, the backing allows orbit. So here I go like that, I'm using the slider, but you see that it, it's sort of like, it won't do it if I pick up the knob, but sometimes if I miss the knob, it, 
seems you know i'm operating on the dial and it's going you know why oh wait a minute and i just thought that for this little size that we got here maybe we don't need to to make it interactive going through that but for the most part we do we do want it to be interactive uh how do we find an example here i'll just go to examples and this one for instance has a big backing and we want the backing to automatically do the orbit controls Okay, but not when we do this and this and this, but when we do this, we want the orbit controls. However, in this very small case right here, I don't think we need to do the orbit controls through that. So uh, we've set backing orbit false on that. And now if we refresh here, it's a little, <laughs> did I save it? Ah, what happened? Am I in the right one? Refresh, we're not supposed to see, yeah, okay, so there, why do I see it through this one? Let's just check. Backing orbit false on the slider. Did the dial also get backing? Oh no, that was the left texture active. Yeah, I thought that was all the same texture active there. I don't know. Because I'm getting it through the dial, but I'm not getting it through the slider. Uh, is this all one texture active? Let's have a look. What do we call that panel? Left. So this is the left side is a texture active. It's 500. Let's change a backing color on it so we can see where it is. Oh no, it's getting styles. So each one would be its own. Left, maybe, and left two. Okay, that's what it is. Left and left two. And so left two is the dial. There's the texture active. Ah, this texture active doesn't have backing orbit false. So maybe we didn't care as much on, on this guy, but we cared on the, on the slider. How did that work? Because, yeah, so there's the slider. It doesn't get it. And the dial does get it because we didn't turn it off on the dial. Okay, fine. I don't know, I thought we turned it off on both of them, but it looks like we only turned it off on the slider. What do you think? Hmm. So to get to backing orbit false, this would be the time when we go, okay, well, backing orbit false, that's, I don't know what parameter that is. That's probably like the fifth parameter. We'd have to go out to the docks. We'd have to see what that parameter is. So at this point, we would say, oh, it's nice and easy to make a, you know, a nice square texture active, but now I'm going to have to go find that other parameter. So I'm just going to convert this width and height. And I'm going to try and also stop saying the word just. Did you notice that when developers talk to you, they're constantly saying, I'm just going to do this, and I'm just going to do that. And you're looking at it going, I would have had no idea that you could do that. Or that doesn't sound like just. That sounds like that's your fifth nested bracket. <laughs> Seriously, I've had people explain React to me, and, they, and we just do this, and we just do that. And by this time, you're in your fifth nested bracket, and you're kind of going, uh, that's not quite a just. <laughs> I've seen it out on the 3JS things, too. I've seen it out on those forums uh, when they're talking about, oh, here's how you build 3JS using Node and stuff. You just do this step, and then just do this step, and then just do this step, and just do this step. And it's like, well, you know, for us, we just copy and paste a quick little template into a text file <laughs> and run it. <laughs> that, to me, is a just, not your uh, Byzantine system. Anyway, blah bitty, blah bitty, blah. Uh, what was it that I was trying to do? Texture active, and then we got the backing orbit false there. We could have styled that in there, I guess, as well. Okay, so that's the Zim Duo technique to uh, drop to the object literal there. And then we can go find some distant parameter, and now we can make that the false on that too. So I save that. We run here, and sure enough, I can operate this thing without worrying. You can press on that, and sometimes when you're trying to press on this, if you accidentally do the orbit controls, I don't know, what do you think? I can't use the orbit controls there. Kind of makes sense. Can't use them there either. Yeah, why don't we leave it like that? However, I will, since this one's dropped down, I will drop these down, but you don't need to. Let's see what I put it right in front of each of those and hit enter. Oh, I should have done it inside of in front of this one too. Okay, there's our left. Could we have styled it? 
yeah, there's the styling, and here's the texture actives. Why don't we just style the backing orbit then? I think that would work. Unless we're going to, how far are we going to use that style? There's the end of the style right there. So yeah, both of these, we would want to have the backing orbit false, in which case we don't need the backing orbit there. And as a matter of fact, we can just say this is 500 by 100, like that, nice and small. And we can say the same thing to this one. This has been a Zim Explore where we explore the Zim Duo technique and style in Zim. Nice, huh? One texture active that size, one texture active this size, and our styling is being applied uh, like that. Then, once we've done that, we turn the style off. We can also turn the style off with style.clear. And you can remember styles and then what is that again? You can store them. What is that series that you do? It's a remember and... <laughs> How's my memory? Yeah. So back in the docs, we hit style. Here's style. So there's style in capital letters where you get to style stuff. Then there's style where we can use the these guys. Style.add, style.remove, style.remember, style.recall. There you go. So if you just remember and uh, then you do some stuff and then you can recall, it will set the style back again. Um, so that's how we deal with it. It's a little bit different than CSS style where you can apply styles after things are made. With Zim, it's you apply the style, you make the thing, and then you clear the style, make something else, apply a different style if you want, etc. So it's a little bit different, but along the same lines. The right-hand side, we're making a synth. So why did we make the synth first? And there's the toggle when we're gonna turn it off or on. We won't spend too much time on the synth here. I don't think it is a texture active called right. So this is on the right side. In other words, what we're doing is these two things right here, the live and the sound. That will turn the synth on. This will make it, if you recall, make it so that... That's a setting on this thing's called a selector. It doesn't have to go in a line like that. It can also go in a grid or a line going vertically, but here we're using it in a line. And normally the selector, once you select things, once it gets there, it changes the value. Once it gets here, it changes the value, but it doesn't change the value as it's animating across. However, if you set uh, the selector to live, then every time it hits one of these things as it's being animated, it changes the value, which is handy for something like this. <laughs> Um, all right, and so we've got a toggle there for the sound. We're putting that on what the texture active, I guess. Toggle centered on the right hand side, so right is the texture active. Remember to center the or like not center, but put them on the texture actives, otherwise, you won't see them. We're moving it a little bit down, then we're saying when that changes, do this stuff. We've got another toggle. This is the live toggle. So we centered that on, on that and we moved it a little bit over and up. Why did we move them over and up? Oh, because they were centered. We should have left aligned them on there. Why didn't we left align those instead of centering them? It would have been easier. Yeah, totally, that would have been easier. Okay, you know what I mean? Uh, I think what happened is we made one and then realized we're gonna need two and we just did some adjustments uh, that way. So if we've got this thing called right, it's now clear, but let's change it to blue. We save this up and refresh. There it is. Why did we bother centering it and then moving one a little bit different, a different amount? Why didn't we just left align them in there? And that would have been easier. Um, do you want to do, okay. Uh, okay, let's do it. So we're going to pose this. Um, this would be some amount from the left. So how about 30 from the left? And some amount 
down. Uh, this one could be the top. Uh, so that's how much we moved it. So we'll say 35, I guess, 35. Is it minus 35? Which one is this? This is one down. Okay, we made the one in the bottom first. So 35 down. So this is from the left, comma, uh, and this is from the center on right. So 30 from the left, uh, 35 from the center. We could have even, probably what would have been better is said how, how far from the bottom, uh, something like 20, 10, right on the bottom. I don't know, it's maybe only 10 from the bottom. on the right thing, then we don't bother with the move. And the other one is going to be similar. Right here, alive, there it is. We don't want to center it and move it some weird amount like that. Instead, we'll position it 30 from the left and 10 from the top on the thing that is called right. <laughs> Sorry, that looks confusing. Our texture active is called right because it's the right hand side, I guess. And so we say that, let's have a look. Not bad. Looks like it could be a little bit to the left now and a little bit less on the top and the bottom. Or we could have tiled that. Tiling it would have been even easier. Even for this, these micro things, I found rather than fiddle with it, it might have been just easy to put that in a tile that has uh, one column and two rows and set the spacing and, and center the tile. Then just take that tile that you made and center it. So uh, certainly would have been easier if you had three or four of these things or you know a collection of them, etc. That, that would have been easier as well. Here, if you've only got two things, it's still not too bad positioning it. So let's change that to 25 in each case. And how about um, eight, I suppose. And down here, let's put that across like so. Keep it kind of the same. You see that? We've dropped that down and we've taken that and dropped that down on our chaining. We do a lot of chaining. It may have been, we don't even need that toggle. I don't know if we do. We reference it probably in here some, somewhere. I don't know, somewhere. Live, there it is, it's being referenced in here, but we could have used the event object there, E, like so. <laughs> Can I get the letter E? I collect E, and then used, in this case, E.target. And not even bothered storing it in live. Hey, I make a toggle, we got everything we need with chaining, and then use E.target inside the event. But this is sort of easy to, understand too. And what do we want to do? We want it to change that 25 and 8. Copy that. 25 and 8. And let's see what we got here now. Mm, looks pretty good. Yeah. I think it looks, oh, <laughs> it won't even matter anyway, because we're making the background clear, not blue. So <laughs> clear background. All right, and here we have it. Oh, that didn't work, did I save it? Did I put the clear in the wrong place? Yeah, that was the toggle, uh, the texture active, clear. Were you screaming at me from home? You're going, no, no. Oh yeah, I did that on purpose to see if you were awake. So there we go. That, didn't even really matter too much, did it, in the scheme of things. That actually looks a touch too close together still for me. So I am going to, my apologies, change that to what's going to make it farther apart. A five, that might be too far apart. But we're going to change that to a five, each of those, and save her up. And uh, Okay, that will do. Nice. If... <laughs> If you weren't with me now, I would probably put that at a six. Aye, aye, aye. Who's the designer now? No, I'm going to go for a coffee break, actually. Hey, come on, you guys. Let's go for a coffee break. When we come back, we'll figure this pixel out. If it should be six, maybe it should be 6.5. Should that be 6.5?
Oh, yeah, it could have been 6.5. That's that's still not, yeah, that's a little bit far. It's like, oh, my goodness, I, I, I can't go to sleep now. Anyway, that's enough of that. So what do we do when we change? We're changing, if it's toggled, which one is this? This is the sound. So if it's toggled, if there's not a tone one, all right. Basically, we don't want to start a synthesizer or any sound until something is interacted with. So that's why we purposely started these without any sound, so that when we can hit sound, that will interact and we can play the sound without getting an error. Sigh. Okay, that's like some... It used to be only a mobile thing, but now it's a browser thing too, where they want you to interact before you play the sound. There might be a way around that. I think I've seen some three jazz stuff where they somehow are playing sound without doing that. I don't know how they do it. Maybe some some uh, domains can get on a list of uh, hot lists sort of saying, yeah, 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 it's all right to play sound from me. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Or maybe it was just I had played sound on some domain before and they, they let that go. I'm not sure what it is. But uh, we're not wanting, we've got these toggles and we're basically saying if there has not been a sound before, a tone before, we're getting a, a tone from our synth, then we need to make one. So here we are making it when we interact. Say hey, synth, make a tone. We're panning that on the left hand side. Cool. The other one is panned. Tone two is panned to the right. So we're making two tones. Uh, one for the one for the top guy here. There's a tone for this one. And there's a tone for this one. This one is panned on the right. This one is panned on the left. Which is kind of too bad because if you spin it around, they're panned on the wrong side. We could have dealt with that if we wanted to adjust the pan, but we didn't bother. I didn't think people were really going to notice the spatial audio. But spatial audio does totally matter. And if we were doing this for real, we would have spent a bit more time making it so that as you spin this around, or uh, it's a little tricky, I guess. It would be easier if we were moving, well, it's probably the, about the same anyway, uh, to do our spatial audio. We did do some spatial audio where we make it as you go farther away, but that's a distance from, it's a little bit easier. Uh, the distance from, we reduced the volume, and as you got closer, we made it louder. We'll see that later. We're starting with a volume of zero in both cases because I think it we're going to ramp up. Uh, maybe not, or where did our ramp? Oh yeah, we got a timeout here. And so we've made the tones. We got this timeout of just a, a small amount there. It's 100 milliseconds. And then we're ramping those tones up to a 0.8 volume. Since uh, in JavaScript or the JavaScript sound audio API is kind of rife with little pops and crackles, and it's like, oh, for Christ's sake, it just took so long. That was, that was some programming to handle the, a, the, the sound API to get our synths going. And we have some pretty cool synth stuff. Um, we have two, two methods, called, one called play where we can play short little 8-bit uh, kind of sounds. They're really cute, made by this guy called Frank Force. And then we've got the tone, where we can generate tones, as many tones as we want, and play them at different notes and different volumes and different shapes. So here we have uh, shapes is coming from our stepper. It's current value. Okay, so we'll have to take a look at that. And there we've got a wah amount and a wah rate and a wah throat. Wow, we can also add vibrato to the, the, that kind of stuff. So we were doing a little bit of experimenting. And you're going to see that this stuff is going to change based on the dial and the slider as well to make it... Oh, and based on the height of, of, uh, of these guys. So this stuff changes it, but it'll maybe... No, I think this stuff changes the height and the speed of these guys, and then it is the height of whichever one's this on. This one's on this one, so the height is going to change the wah, and the height on this one is going to change the wah. If you move it over to here, then it's obviously the height of this bar changes the wah. It's not terribly effective. <laughs> but what was cool is when we sped it up, like this speeds it up, and when we sped it up 10 times that, so it's just going... 
Uh, it was actually pretty cool. It's got... Uh, that was effective, but not very pleasant. So we... Uh, we didn't make it go that fast. <laughs> okay, so there's our synthesizer stuff, our two tones, where we're doing a ramping. If we already have a tone there, then we're just going to ramp it up from zero. If we have toggled it off, then we're going to ramp it... Oh, mm, let's see, else fade out. Ah, zero, right. This must be the time, and this is the volume. So ramp to 1 and 0.8, and this is ramp to 0 and 0.8. So that, that's fading the sound. That's nice, isn't it? When we fade the sound rather than just turn it right on and off. Let's have a listen. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to turn up the volume. We didn't apply a volume because we were doing the volume this way. Ready? I'm going to ramp it down. Cool, huh? Okay, that's nice. You can do that on... We do it quite often with sound. You can also do it with sound. That is an odd. Zim's got A-U-D, odd. We've also got vid, and we've got uh, pick. So pick, vid, odd, SVG. Those are some of our ways of bringing in assets. So that would be any sound, and you can change the volume of it and animate the volume so easily in Zim. It's just, why bother just turning it off and on when you can just go dot animate, uh, squiggly bracket volume colon zero. That's it. So you have your volume object dot animate squiggly bracket volume colon zero. That will animate the sound down in one second. You could specify a second or like a time after that. If you want to ramp it back up or like animate it back up, um, volume colon one. And so that's so easy to do that when you're making things playing some music or whatever, you should always animate your, your volume. Bum, 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 bum. Hopefully you guys are doing okay on this Zim Explorer. Ooh. Yeah. What we should do is anytime we play the Zim Explorer like that, it, it should be your pause time, do a little stretch, come back with your mind fresh. Sound good? Okay. Hey, welcome back. It's Dr. Abstract. Uh, you, were, you were off getting a cookie or some licorice. Super. So live, this is the toggle that toggles the live index. What the heck? Uh, it's live toggle this. It looks the same. Oh, S1, S2, live index. Ah, that's the property name, live index. So we normally would get an index, like what, what number this stepper is on. And that would happen when the or not the stepper, this would happen when the selector uh, hits the end. So what we're talking about now is when it hit, when this thing hits the end, you get a selected index. So that's how you, you, you find out what number we're on. So this is live index, whereas you're doing that, it goes and does the live index. So that's us setting that right there. Here's the stuff for the top, and this is a new texture active that is going to do our organ stuff. So here's a shapes object right here that holds organ is whatever's coming. That's the JSON file. So we don't put the JSON string directly, but we're getting the JSON from uh, the asset object. This is a global function in Zim called asset. It used to be how we would get a picture, text, sound all come in in the asset it still works that way but in zim 10 or nft i can't remember which one it was we said all right rather than always getting an asset we're going to make a new pick a new vid a new odd and so we did that however we didn't say make a new json it was a little bit awkward because json's already a keyword and we can't make it three letters give us a new jso <laughs> so we had pick odd vid SVG, but a new JSO, a JSO, <laughs> could have done that, I guess. So we just left it in the asset. There we are uh, grabbing the, uh, the JSON object for the organ, for the, uh, for the cosmic sound, but the buzzy so sound is just a saw. So that's an existing waveform. Some other existing waveforms are a sign, a zap, a, uh, 
square. Give us a square wave, a triangle. I think there's a triangle wave. So those are wave forms. What did we say this one was? <laughs> Can't remember. A saw. All right. And then we have any other ones that we're pulling from S SV or from um, JSON data. Here's our stepper. We're changing some things about that stepper. And there we're, we are passing the list to the stepper. So now we're going to step through these words right here. And these words are just lookups, as you can see here, here and here, they match. So that when we change the stepper, if there is an existing tone already, we're going to set that tone shape. Oh, you know what I realize that just means is if we set the shape before we start the sound, it's not actually going to set it here, is it? <laughs> Do you want to try? I found a bug. All right, so we go to Buzzy, and then we say, give me us the sound. Oh, hey, wait a minute, it didn't know. Oh, I know why. Because when we start the tone, so up here we're starting, this is us playing the tone, and we've said the shape is whatever the um, shape's current value, uh, the stepper's current value is. So shapes at, so here's shapes right there, shapes at the stepper's current value. So that handled it. Ah, oh, we didn't find a bug. Ah, oh, who coded this? They're so good. Oh my goodness. All right. Anyway, uh, that's us when we change the stepper. We go and change the tone's shape property to whatever's in the shapes at the current value. You got it? Yay, just some traditional programming. Okay, cool. Uh, from a lookup table. The cylinders. Wow. I'm almost going to need one of those. It's a Zim Explorer and let's go grab a cookie or a licorice. Can we make it? How long have we been going with this Explorer? It has been an hour and six minutes. Oh, that's nothing. I, I can do it. Let's, let's go. Maybe, maybe once, maybe once we get to the, uh, the 3JS side, I'll go get my own piece of licorice, put this thing on pause. Rarely do that. Almost always go right the way through. The only time I ever pause, I've learned to pause the recording when I need to cough or have a grumble or the telephone rings or something like that. But otherwise, I usually don't put it on pause and go get a licorice. That would be cheating in my mind. If I expect you to listen all the way through, <laughs> then I gotta, I gotta talk all the way through. There we go. All right, so our pickers. So what kind of pickers are we talking about here? What are the pickers? I think we call these things the pickers, although that's a pretty bad name for it, considering we have a, what is this? Oh, this is a stepper. Okay, so we, we have a color picker, so we don't actually have a component called picker. So that's all right. I might have called this component, though, since this is called a selector, I might have uh, labeled this selectors, but whatever. I just called it a picker for this app. Here's our selector one, which is a texture active. And whoa, width, spacing, num, magnify, oh my God. So we've uh, abstracted some variables out here that will help us organize because we've got to make this selector match the distance between all of these cylinders. So we have several different places where we're using the same spacing which means we don't want to put those in two places, so we put them up here. And that means we've operated down in here. So that's basically getting the right width for the whole thing. The width for all the way across here, based on how many we've got, and the spacing in between, and the width of them, or radius, or whatever we're storing. So what are we storing? The radius of the tubes, the spacing between, I think that might be can't remember if it's the spacing here. Usually that's what spacing is, or if it's just be, uh, you know, right between the spacing between the centers. Might be the spacing between the centers. The number of them and margins and magnify. Uh, I don't know what those are being used for. Uh, we do know that there's a difference between the Zim objects. They look like this. 
So they have different sizes. There they are. They're slightly, you know, it just depends. And yet this is in 3JS, this stuff. So we usually put the scaling down on the various objects. So when we when it comes to put those in place, they are right here. Mm, here's the material. There's the there's the mesh. Where's the geometry? We're looking for the geometry. There's the geometry right there. And that has the same kind of stuff being used, the spacing and the number. And I don't see any scaling done on it here. But the size might relate. So I guess we're doing the scaling on the, on the texture up here. Anyway, usually it maps on pretty easily and you just have to fiddle with some numbers, a scaling number sometimes. Sorry, that wasn't very succinct, was it? <laughs> yeah, 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 I got that, yeah. Uh, cylinders. Okay. And we got a corner of that. Uh, we are putting the series in a color. Look, here we are using a series. Sort of a weird one. Do you recognize that? Do you know why we made it specifically that series? What does that remind you of? White key, black key, white key, black key, two white keys. What? Black key, white key. Those are the notes on the piano. Yeah, you got it. Rah, let's give them a hand. All right, so that's just the scales on a piano. We did go from, I think, a C to another C. So this one very at the top here, <laughs> how does that help? <laughs> Can you even tell? So uh, let's put this one down here. So that's low, high, oh, I did an octave. Um. Got it. All right. So those are the notes on, on the piano. And we're using that series to tile a bunch of rectangles. So the selector itself, which is where, right here, expects a tile. And it uses that tile to uh, put a little selector on it. So we're using a Zim tile here where we're tiling a new rectangle based on something there. So that's the spacing times magnify. That's the space. I think the spacing is the space between the cylinders rather than the space between the edges of the cylinders. I got that. Not that it matters. You can figure this out. It's just some coding stuff. So we're calling the spacing the distance between this cylinder and that cylinder, the spacing rather than the edges of the cylinder. And then magnify relates to the Zim thing is bigger in some way. And we're passing color. So every time we tile a rectangle, the first time it will pick this color, next time it will pick that color, next time it picks that color. If we passed in an array, whoop, like that, then what we would get is randomly picking from all of those things. And we wouldn't get a very... Uh, hmm, that didn't work out at all. Oh, we have to delay the pick. So when it we pass in random colors there, let's see what's happening. That's our tile. I don't know. It's randomly, it looks like it randomly picked on the, oh, it is randomly picking. It was just like totally randomly picked all white on the top, which, which happens. So there you can, the, the odds of picking white are better because we got more white keys in here than we have black keys. And the very first time I ran it, they were all white. It was like, what? So anyway, that, that is it randomly um, picking in there. But we don't want to randomly pick. We want a series of them like so. We're registering the center of those things. That is important. It's expected when you've got a selector here, it's expected that whatever you're tiling is center reg. So it just takes whatever we're putting around it and uh, surrounds, surrounds its center like that. And we're setting the alpha down on those. If we didn't, then we would get this. 
boom, 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 boom. We'd actually be able to see that it looks more like a piano, <laughs> which uh, is kind of cool. Although we might want little gaps in there, perhaps. So we could get some gaps by telling it when we do the tile, the default spacing is zero. So this would be spacing H in the horizontal of say two or something like that should make little gaps in there. Cute little gaps. We can't really see the selector very well though, can you? But we could make the selector itself have different or look different. Make it a little round circle or something. All right. Uh, undoozies. Undoozies. Alphas three. I think I'll call it that from now on. That was fun. An undoozy. Ooh. If it's a big undo, like a lot of undoos, that was an undoozy. Oh, yes. And we're cloning the second tile. I'm not sure why we need to clone the two tiles. We're passing a tile into the selector. Sometimes what happens if one selector takes a tile and the other selector goes, no, I didn't save that. Uh, and the other selector goes and takes a tile, then the other selector says, I want that tile. And it just pulls the tile from the first selector and puts it in the second selector. So that's probably why if you're wanting to use the same tile, then clone it before you put it in the second selector. And we're applying some style that will get applied to these selectors. Because uh, we said, hey, apply this stuff to the selectors. Just watch that, not the tiles or the rectangles in it. So we might have had to do that unless it, these kinds of things started affecting the rectangles inside the selector. It depends on how the inheritance is set up. And Zim's got it so that you can set inheritance or say, don't style this or do style this. It's all quite complete. All right, I don't know exactly why we're doing that stuff. That relates to trying to get this little box. Normally a selector isn't right on the tile box. Normally the selector is around, like it's a, a selection around this object. And you got usually got some um, spacing in there as well. Here we were wanting a box with no corners right on there. So that's what, that's what we're getting. We're getting, uh, a box right on there rather than applying the padding. Okay, so that's what the selector looks like in Zim. Quite often the selector, I don't know, let's go out and take a look at Zim under examples. I believe we introduced the selectors in our collection called Zim Cat. So under collections here, there's Zim Cat features. And oh, let's use the cat. I think we operated on this was what zim looked like at the time of zimcat and we had all of the new features on here including all this stuff oh very exciting effects and anyway but over on the other side or i press on the cat here over on the other side we did this neat little uh, quiz here about what are all these things called and this one is called a what is this called <laughs> that's called a scrambler um, but there's the selector right there. And you see how the rectangle goes around that? So this one's called the selector. So we put that one there. Bing, selector. And if we called all the other ones, right? That's tabs. Good. Dial. Nope. Dial's up here. Oh, we missed up the selector. Now that's a slider. This is an indicator indeed. And a toggle. Test. Yeah! Yeah! And if we go on, this is this is the Zim list. So you could add a list to your texture actives. Here's another one of those uh, scramblers. That's called the scrambler. Um, that's just radio buttons. Here's the stepper. Remember, that's called a stepper. And these things, what are called? Yeah, that's a squiggle. And this is indeed a blob. It's not a bean or a putty or a shaper. That's a Zim blob. And you could put that on your textures as well. Over here, another selector. So see how the selector works here? You got that? So usually that's what the selector work looks like. And I believe that we used one more selector in here. There, by the way, is a stepper that has arrows at the top and the bottom. Ooh, fancy, huh? And here's one more, look at that custom selector. Who is Dr. Abstract? 
Hmm. Is Dr. Abstract Dan Zen? Frank Loss? Frank Force. There's Frank Force that we mentioned. Or is it this guy, Chris? He's, he's the code pen guy. It is indeed. Dan Zen is really Dr. Abstract. Now you know my secret identity. Dum, dum, dum. Test. Okay, so there's some stuff there. You should probably take a look at all of these collections. Can you believe it? Every single one of these is like a mini site of stuff. Wow. Wow. All right, well, we'll leave that. Because remember, we're not supposed to be going on, what is it, tangents. We're supposed to stick with the program. Sticking with the program, because it's a long one. All right, we've got some notes. And what do we, how do we use those notes? The selectors, oh, the selectors are going to play those notes. Oh, my goodness. So those are all the notes that the selector is going to play. And here is the selector. We're passing it the tile. The selector has been styled. The tile has been styled as well. Or was it? I don't know. I can't remember. Somewhere up there was the tile. And when the selector changes right here, we are going to say, if there is a tone that has been made, then please set tone one's note to the... Ah! We're going to have a bug. Yeah, will there be a bug this time? What if we change the selector's selection before we start the music because I don't think when we started the music that we went to the selectors to get that note I think we played just a basic note so let's try it see if we have a bug so we refresh here we're going to go to the very highest note and the very highest note here and let's see if it's playing the very highest note when we turn on the sound hmm, how can we tell No, there's the highest note, see? So we must have been starting when we started. Yeah, there's the start sound for this one here and that one there. Black key. Okay, and yet, watch this. So now if we if we don't start there, if we start like, like I said, the highest notes and play, it's not at the right note should have been here is what it should have sounded like when we started okay so um if we wanted to fix that then what is this this is called s1 and it would be s1 dot selected index so we would come up to here and where would we have our sound right there s1 is presumably this S1's selected index, yeah, and here it wouldn't be G1, it would be S2's selected index. Do you like? Now let's have a listen. All right, now let's just start it. <laughs> I can't hear it. I think something broke. Are we getting an error? F12. It's there, but it's very faint. Why is the sound so low? That's nice and loud. Okay, so let's just try this. Let's change the selective in selected index. Of them. Did we put that in a volume instead? Well, like, well, what's the problem? I don't get it. So that that's the note. I don't know why having a different note there would uh, change it. So let's undo that. This was a C0 and a G1. The selected indexes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I get it. The notes at the selected index. Ah, so we need this. Were you sitting there at home going, no, 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 no. The selected index is just a number. That's not going to do it. So, yeah, okay. Up in here, we go notes at S1 selected index. And here, notes at selected to index. Oh, darn. Should have known that. Okay, ready? Check. 
Yay! So that's a good start. And now let's put this way up here. And this one way up here. Ready? Oh. Do we refresh? I can't remember if we refresh. So there's we're at the start now. Put this way up here. And way up here. And Yay! Yay! It works. So now we can play around with this beforehand. As soon as we turn the sound on, it will be playing the right sound. Uh, let's update that. There, just upload it. Ah, key. That means it will be working live for the next people who try it out. <laughs> Excellent. Nothing like fixing things when we're live on video, huh? All righty, so those are the notes. Oh my goodness, we've reached 3JS, yay! So the other selector worked the same way. Note that we've we've put both those selectors, centered it on selector two. This one is centered on selector one. Selector one is a new texture active. So what is selector two? Selector two is a clone of selector one, nice. So we can clone, or we try our hardest to make sure that every display object or every object in Zim, you can clone it and you can dispose it. Cloning means make a copy of it. Sometimes it's quite tricky, but in this case, it flows through. We can clone a page, we can clo clone a container. Uh, it won't though, don't try and make your whole select, like uh, this was the uh, object. We tried it, I think. We tried putting everything in selector one right here there's selector one and we're, we're tiling something and then we're making a selector and then we're uh, centering that selector on selector one we can't just say uh, selector one dot clone and have everything in it we did have to put the selector in it so it didn't clone everything that was in it sometimes it does uh, it was just hard we're then having to clone a couple components, which we could do, it would clone that. Um, I don't know why it didn't do it, but it didn't. So we took a new selector and it doesn't clone events. That's another thing. So a, an event is a custom property on an object. And usually that stuff doesn't, it doesn't clone events. There is, we do have a copy. I wonder if a copy would have worked. A copy no, uh, duplicate, a duplicate, sorry. We do have copies, but copies are used on object literals to copy object literals and stuff. But if you, wanna, uh, if you want to clone an object and keep the custom properties, then you can do a duplicate. But I don't know if that's gonna handle all of your components that are inside there as well. <sighs> duplicate. Don't do that, but I think we need, I don't know if we need a reference to an S2. We'd end up like operating probably the same one again. And maybe that's, let's just comment that out. Maybe it works, but you're, okay. There's n nothing going on on the inside of that duplicated one. So it didn't, didn't quite work there. Anyway, apologies, clone. No, we got most of it right. <laughs> Yay! We got most of it right. Hey. Okay, here's our break. Ta-da! We've hit a break time. So this has been a Zim Explore. Ooh, we knew this was going to be a long one. That's right, we knew it was going to be a long one. Uh, but we're going to just pause it here. You can pause it here as well. And then we're going to jump right into the 3D side. So here comes the pause. Rudum, pause. Oh, <laughs> pause the sound. I'm such a loser. I'm going to pause this. I'm just going to go take a little break and you'll hear me come back all refreshed. Oh my goodness, I'm back already. That was very tempting. It's 8 o'clock p.m. 8, 8 p.m. and I haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> it was like, but. Yeah, I'm a, a trooper. I'm going to finish this off and then I'll go have a nice relaxing dinner. I don't have to worry about coming back to do more video. Okay, so on the 3JS side, I won't talk too much about what this is doing because we mentioned it in the uh, earlier bubblings uh, and the uh, earlier 
um, explores. And so hopefully you saw it there, but we're, we're getting a scene and a camera and a render from here. We've also asked, this is the first time we've asked for an ortho camera and ortho scene. Okay, so turn ortho true and in behind that gives us an ortho camera. When it comes to looking at the HUD version right here, so when we do the explore on the HUD, at that point I'll show you what's in behind the raw HUD as well and that has includes the ortho camera. But that gives us the normal perspective camera and scene and the ortho camera and scene here. We're bringing in a skybox in a very normal way. Hey, adding it to the scene. We're bringing in our orbit controls, which comes from our import of zim underscore three, comes with orbit controls. And here's the texture actives part. One for the ortho, that's the HUD around the outside, and one for the organ stuff, that's, that's this guy. So this guy is, well, let's refresh it and get it working right. So this is the perspective one. That's why we can move it like that. And here is the ortho, which means that it uh, is in two dimensions here. And we pick the dimensions that show like that. We're passing the logo, the top, the left, the left, and the right into there. The order doesn't matter. So those are all the texture active objects that we made that holds all that stuff. We pass it our three reference, our three reference right there. That hand helps handle scaling and stuff that uh, we need to know about. Although you don't need to use our three, the raw versions don't, we just pass null there and defined. Then we get the render, the ortho scene, the ortho camera and controls, and we're storing that on layer, uh, well we're not storing it, but any we're only ray casting, we'll only ray cast layer one. So that means everything that we add below needs to go into layer one. And that prevents us from ray casting everything that you have in 3JS. Uh, if you don't have much else in 3JS, then you can just leave this off and makes it a bit easier. And we're doing that the same with the texture actives uh, instead of the texture actives ortho. And in that case, we're passing only selector one and selector two. Those are our two texture active objects that hold the selector here. Okay. Same deal here, except the scene and the camera rather than the scene ortho and the camera ortho. Once again, those came from right here. We use the same render throughout, but there's one scene and camera and here's the other scene and camera. So every time you have a different camera, you've got to have a different texture actives, plural. Probably doesn't happen too much for you. I would, most things have just one camera and most of the, all the other examples pretty well, except the, maybe even the other HUD example, because in the other HUD example, we just had the texture actives in the HUD and we didn't have any texture actives in the three, uh, in the perspective camera. We have some lights. Uh, just beware with Zim. I don't know if I mentioned this before. I don't think I did, but uh, we have a light color. So if you come up here, there we are, we're passing in black and black, but we've also got dark and darker and we have light and lighter. So don't use the variable light because it will override that color. I don't know if you, you maybe you're not using that color, but light and light two, or sorry, light one, light two. So we've got a couple of lights and note there's some changes to the lights. We're in, we're using 3JS 1.55 or R155 and not 1.55, 155, 155 versions. Wow. We're at that too. It's that we did a whole bunch of subversions and you know, otherwise we'd be at that many changes. You know, it's nothing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> had some, some fun naming conventions at Zim. All of our Zim major releases have three letters. That would be one, O-N-E, duo, tri, fourth, the number four, T-H, V, six, hep, oct, neo, ten. And then we went to NFT when NFTs were big. We went to cat after that. We thought we'd do three letter animals like eel and elk and owl. Uh, and <laughs> then we said, okay, okay, forget that. 
we'll just this one is called Zim version Zim, and it was the final version of Zim. It was supposed to be the final version of Zim, and we went to sort of major releases on zero 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 one zero two, and thought we'd just do that all the way up. But it was too embarrassing to kind of say, "Hey, Zim's on version zero three, you know," and it was like, "No, it isn't." So we <laughs> switched her again and went to zero one four. So that's 14, which actually matched in the scheme of numbers. It's 14, and now we're on 0, 1, 5, and that's how we will continue. So a little pivot. That's uh, fine. Hey, are we like Microsoft? <laughs> XP, Vista, all right, whatever. Now, what we were talking about here. Oh, yes, uh, this is R155 for 3JS. And there's been some changing to lighting, so just putting a one there won't do what it did before. You've got to multiply it by math.py in theory, although we found that that was still off a little. A few other things to do with lighting and, and color management and stuff that you want to look into, but you can go to the 3JS site and catch that if you want. All right, here's our ortho scene. So this is all the stuff in our ortho scene. That's the HUD. And then here's all the stuff in the normal scene. Wow, that wasn't much of a scroll, was it? Our whole HUD was just right in there. It's like, whoa, really? Okay, that's not too much. Oh, hey, okay, I'm ready. We can do it. So here's our ortho stuff. The HUD logo is a three make panel. So this is our little helper library. And make panel is anything that has a plane geometry P-L-A-N-E geometry, which is quite often for HUDs. You don't have to have it that way, though. You could put your HUD on a curve, maybe. That might look cool. Uh, I haven't actually made a curved plane. I should look into doing that. I think that might be nicer in world to have a curved plane. But still, your main menu might look kind of cool with that. You don't have to do the HUD this way. You don't have to do the HUD on an ortho. We had another example with the uh, this one here. Zim examples, and it was this one where this guy right here, uh, no, we can look around and it stays in the way. That's not in ortho, that's on the camera. So we just stuck it in the camera itself. You have to make sure that you add the camera to the scene to be able to do that. But if you add the camera to the scene, you just put this in the camera and it stays in front of you. And that's kind of neat. Get rid of it. And off we go. Wee! Yeah, and isn't that cool? And that snaps in. But we already did one on that. You were, we're solving the, the problems in there. Anyway, we won't do that. Okay, so, uh, however, if you wanted to put stuff around the edges, you can't rely on putting it in the camera. Then you have to kind of figure out how wide the edges are. And it's a bit harder. The ortho, hand, this gets handled all for us because we've introduced a pose, a special position, because we realize that this is tricky. We introduced a special position on the panel. And we'll talk more about that when we go into the ortho. Why don't we do that? This one's long enough without talking about what we did to get the ortho to work properly and behind. In the next Explorer, when we look at the ortho specifically, then we'll talk about that because we made a simplified ortho example or a HUD example, and we'll talk about it then. All right. Um, anyway, there's the, the make panel. We're positioning that. This is the logo, 35, 35 from the left top, and 450 is what? <laughs> is, that, is that really the scale? Position top left, 450, 450, 450. They're all 450. What the heck is 450 doing there? Hmm, I don't know. Usually that's uh, the, the, the fourth parameter there is... Uh, what object we're putting that on? 450. What would that be? Let's go take a look, I guess. I can't even remember discussing in the docs the pose on that. I wonder if we did. Maybe I found something that's undocumented. So we want to go to 3 in this case. 3 right here because the method was on 3 and it was the pose. <coughs> Position X and Y. No, that's not it. The... Flip material, make panel right here. Yeah, I didn't document, or we didn't document, the pose on that. Unless I'm looking really quickly. You see that? So here's the make panel. That returns a mesh, but somewhere, it's not here either. That's, that's properties. 
somewhere we would have to tell it, um, okay, that mesh, we've got this, we've added this special pose to it and what it's doing, because I don't know what the 450 is. <laughs> oh no, it must be something magical. They've all got it. Okay, well, tune in in the next Explore. We will explain what that 450 is. Right now, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so tune in in the next Explore, and that's fine. And then we're HUD. The HUD, what is the HUD? Here is, is where is the HUD? HUD.ad, HUD.ad. HUD is a group. Okay, so HUD's a new 3JS group. Why did we add it to a 3JS group, you ask? Do you know the answer? Oh, no, HUD, HUD. So the, the top one here, this very first one, we don't need to put in the group because we're not making it disappear. But all these other ones, we're gonna put in this group right here, HUD, HUD, HUD. So we're not adding it to the scene, but rather than, because uh, we're already added to the ortho scene, we've added the HUD logo. Wait a second, that's just a group, uh, HUD.add. How did we get that group to show up in there? Oh, there it is. Scene ortho and the HUD. Okay. So down, we don't need to put that down below. We could have put it up here. Mm, there's the HUD. There's where we added it. What do you think? Put it back up there. Maybe. Okay, although it was a sort of a nice ending to the, we've indented that. We don't really need to indent that. We're kind of showing that the, these things got added to our, our group there. So it's a faux indent. <laughs> F-A-U-X indent. A faux indent. <laughs> All right, we do some other faux indents. Have you seen those faux indents? That's not really, that's a real indent, isn't it? But the chaining, we when we chain, I don't know, we like doing the indenting, but sometimes the editor doesn't know what the heck we're doing there. We could dot onto the end of that in a big, long, straight line, but we like to drop it down. And when we do drop it down, we do an indent in there, like so. Okay, so there's one panel. We don't know what the 450 is. Here's another panel, uh, left, to, uh, left, left to, right. We're all adding them to the texture actives ortho. See, that's in all of those. And when you do the make panel, it will automatically put it in layer one or whatever layer this is turned on. So you don't even have to worry about matching that up. It just gets done automatically. And there they all are, the slider, the dial, the sound, and the stepper, all positioned where we want them. That much from the left bottom, this much from the left bottom. Note it's up a little bit higher because that's the dial. It's up above. So we get the dial up above that one. And we're going to position these guys on the right-hand side. So they're on the right-hand side. And one's at the bottom, one's at the top. These amounts. Nice and easy. Amazing. And then the cylinders. So the last thing we have to look at then is how do we go into our perspective camera and position the cylinders and how to make them move with, with sound, I guess. So here we are making the cylinders. There's the geometry for the cylinder. Here we have a set of bars and our bar material we're going to store in there. So here's a bar is the mesh of that. So that represents the actual cylinder mesh. And we're putting, pushing that into bars. We're also adding it to the scene. So this sort of keeps track of an array of our meshes because we're probably going to have to add that array of meshes somewhere down below, I guess. Oh yeah, I think we dot it into the, where did we dot it? Meshes, meshes, what do they have? Anyway, whatever, we'll see soon. Soon enough. So we have an array of that. Uh, there's us positioning them based on some spacing, each one with this I. So I, when we do a zim loop through s some numbers, what is num? What the heck is num? That's how many, so an I and a total. Okay, that's it. So uh, num is whatever, 12 of them or 13 of them. And then we get the index and we can also ask for the total. That means within here, we're gonna know num. We probably knew num anyway, but sometimes you don't. 
sometimes you just put a number here, going like 20. Okay, and that means if we want inside of here to know that our total is 20, then we can collect it there. This is the Zim loop. However, here I don't think we need it. And we could have used num there. Do you want to do that? I think that makes the most sense. Num, get rid of the T, get rid of all this stuff. Just collect the I as we're going through, because we're going to use num. Any other T's around? Hello. No, I don't see any. I'm not quite sure what we're doing here. We're making different materials with colors, hue saturation colors based on the eye and certain percentages. So that's playing around with the color of our material using HSL to get this nice, uh, the shades from starting here to roughly there. You can goof around with that and figure out what you're doing or what we're doing. And then we're making a bar, which is our mesh. So we're calling each of those round tubes a bar, putting them in the array and putting them on the scene. And we're positioning them. Great. So that made our bars. The pickers themselves uh, are boxes. So, and they'll be as long. So right now we're making these two long boxes. There's the end of the box right there. Can you see that? See that little end of the box? And then the boxes go all along there to the other side. So we need to make two boxes and we're gonna put textures on there. Unfortunately, we if we put the just the texture on the one, do you wanna see what that looks like? Oh, it might be more complicated than we thought because we made a material here with one flip. So I think I can do it by just saying, why was the opacity difference? Oh, those are on the very edges, but we can get rid of those too. Which one have the texture actives? That's that one, the map. And so I think, comment out, say those three and these two. And we don't want an array anymore. All right, let's probably do it. It's kind of neat to see. It didn't do it. Why not? Return an array of that. It must be expecting an array. Oh, there. It must be expecting an array somewhere else. Or that might have been it. Yeah, that was it. No. That, that, that's no good. That didn't look good at all. Why not? That's the map. Transparent. True. I don't know. Maybe we're using that array in some other way down below. Okay, I was gonna what what it would what it would have done if it it did as we expect or as we started, is this texture right here where we can move this, would have been on this face, it would have been on the top face too and that would have worked and it would have worked on the bottom face so there it is on the bottom as well, it also would have shown up on the edge faces and you could have clicked the edge faces and it would have been this this whole big long thing would have been sitting on this edge a little small guy. But on the back, it would be flipped. So if I pressed here, the box would be here. But on the front, the box would be over here on this side rather than matching. So that's why we had to break. Well, a couple of reasons why we broke to different materials. One, so we didn't put this big long thing on this edge. Alternatively, you could have put the box there and you could have just run a plane along here and put it only on the very front. But we like the look of it. You see how it kind of wraps right around it? I thought that looked kind of nice. You could have done this without using a texture active at all by just having a 3JS cube here. And when I pressed over here, had that 3JS cube move along to position there. You may have done things like that already. But I could do this. I uh, could have, here I'm boasting, boast, boast, boast. I could do this if it weren't, weren't for the fact that I had to pull it off the different material and the fact that we had two of these. But if I wanted to throw one of these things along here, even if even with multiple materials, I could have done that in about two minutes. And I don't think you could have worked out how to slide a tube or a, like a, a... And also this is just a little bit beyond just a square being moved along here. Well, that would have been a fine interface too. It's not only a square, but it's this square that has different colors on the back of it and so forth. So it's, uh, it's you know, it's subtle. 
could even be more than that. It could be as we move like that, it might leave particles going along and behind. There's all sorts of things that we can do. Uh, Zim's very powerful at doing things like that. It's a lot easier probably than trying to mimic that kind of thing in 3D uh, for something like this. Cool. All right, coming back though, let's have a quick look through here. It did get kind of confusing because we wanted to do this as in a, an abstracted way as possible. And as you see, we've got, got a lot of things going on here. We've got uh, one, two, three sides wanting it, and two sides on the ends not wanting it, and the last side wanting a flipped version of it. And we've got two of them, the top one and the bottom one. Okay, so it, it boils down to this, though. It's not too bad. We've really only got the materials in one place, but we threw that in a function called make materials. And we're telling that function uh, a couple different things. I don't know what those are doing. Map one. Oh, map is the one that goes from left to right, and map two is the flipped material. Okay, map and map two. And so that's in a function so that we can run that function twice right here. Here's the pick material, and here's the uh, pick material two. So pick material, pick material two, both call make material. One passes pick, picker texture and picker texture flipped. The other one passes pick, picker texture to <laughs> Peter Piper picked a picker texture and picker texture flipped to. Okay. Um, and so that's how we're doing it in just one place and handling that. What is that material? Indeed. Let's go take a look. There's the geometry. Here is the texture. Note we're, we're calling selector ones canvas in both cases. Selector ones canvas, selector ones canvas. So that's fine. This is the flipped or the, the material for the flipped, and this is the material for the not flipped. It's okay, it's the same material. Where we're doing the flipping isn't here with the, or sorry, it's the same, te uh, the same texture. Where we're doing the flipping is on the material. So the flipped material right here is mapped, okay, where do we do the flipping? Map two is not flipped, somewhere we flip it. Uh, so we're looking at this material right here. Do you see a flip anywhere? Flipped. I don't see a flipped. Let's look for a flip, flip. Material flip. Material flip is that. Okay. Control F flip. F L I P. I could read it. Use the Zim3 flip material function. Oh, good. I went looking for it. All right. So, right here it is, right here. Ah, so we made a special uh, method on the, on the three object. We made a special one called flip material which takes your material and its mappings and will handle the flipping for you. That's off in the Zim 3. So if you wanted to take, this is after all, bum, bum, bum. Oh no, why, I'm on pause. Okay, hang on a second. Remember I told you I paused the music? There we go. Um, dum, dum. Uh, this is a Zim Explorer after all. So let's just do a quick explore into our code here. There's the CDN. And in the CDN, underneath our main versions, are the modules. There's the cam, the game, the physics, the pizzazz, the three. 2.3. Right here. And in here, we will see flip material. So if we didn't do this, you would have to done it yourself. What do we do? We ask for the material type and default to a base um, mesh basic material. We have the parameters for the mapping. We are going to rotate the material and flip it. So that's the trick. You got to rotate it and flip it and set it center to halfway before you do that. And then we have stored the fact that it is flipped. If we didn't do this, so this is this is useful. 
for you to know that what we're doing in behind here is we're putting on that material some user data that is texture active flipped true. That means when we raycast, we know that that material is flipped. Otherwise, the raycasting won't match up on a flipped material. So when we realize that, oh, God, it's a lot of little steps and our raycasting is still wrong, that's when we realized we had to take it internally. So if you want to flip a material because the back of the cube is different, when, when this happens, for instance, if you had a cube or a box, all of the sides are right. Say you had some text on that, on the material, you had some text, you would be able to read that text on every side except the back side, which would be completely flipped. So if you don't want it to be flipped, if you want that to be, <laughs> you read the text, which often you do, then you use the three library, just flip that material as, as we've done here. That will handle our flip, uh, that will flip our ray casting values as well in behind the scene. And that's probably, there it is. Uh, to guide the texture actives, Raycast to flip, uh, sorry, I have a hair or something in my mouse. There we go. Uh, to guide the texture actives, Raycast to flip the UV X coordinate. That's all that's needed there. That little guy to flip it. Okay, good. <sighs> Big sigh. We're adding it to the scene. We're positioning that in the Y in a certain way. The, the one picker needed to be positioned, I guess, up a little bit. Or is that down a little bit? I guess that's down a little bit for you guys in 3JS. And then don't forget, if you're not using the very easy make panel, because your, ge your geometry is something other than a plane, as in this case, it's uh, a box. If you're not using that, then you need to make sure that you add your mesh to the texture actives. So we've made a mesh, and there's our texture actives that we want to add it to. Uh, that's the, the name of it right there, and that's our mesh. And then this is the layer. So that layer needs to match our texture actives layer. Where is our texture actives? Here it is. We're adding it to that one. There's the layer. All right. Good. And we do the same thing with the second one as well. Note that this one we moved up, and this one we moved down. And that's what's causing these to be up and down. Right. Nice, huh? We were going to do this with just one, and that's how we started, obviously. Just one note on there, but it was kind of nice to get the drone going and the harmonies and play around with it, so why not do two, huh? If you wanted three notes, you could do three. And then you could have three-part harmonies, or <laughs> three-part discord, if you want. Oh my gosh, we haven't done the noise yet. So here's the noise object. This is a Zim noise object, which makes those cylinders go up and down. And noise is really cool. Maybe you don't know about noise, but this is an equation, All right? It's an equation that's, uh, there's Perlin noise, there's simplex noise. Perlin noise is copyright. We use simplex noise in Zim, and it makes this long equation. And it's really cool. You can zoom in on the equation, and that looks like this. Uh, no, that's the speed of it. Hang on. Uh, there. If we zoom in on it, let's make, slow this down a little bit. Now you see how all of these are level? Uh, we're zooming in on that noise equation. And the more we zoom in on it, the smoother it appears. But when we pull out, so here's us pulling out now. Until we get to here. Now look how we're, we pulled out, and from afar it looks like uh, noise on a tell. You remember noise on a television? Static, like just in black and whites and stuff. Um, that's all seemingly very random. So from out, like from far away in the noise equation, this looks like noise. It's all very random. But if we zoom in on it, we get less and less randomness. 
Uh, by the way, I don't know if you can tell what's happening here. This is going to be a touch of an issue maybe with you. But we're only tracking the mouse when we're over the texture active panel down here. So as I use this and, and go around, if my mouse goes outside, it's not tracking it. Normally in Zim, we do track outside of the component and sometimes even out of the frame. But here, we're losing our, our interactivity unless we stay in there. So that might be a good reason to kind of make this rectangle a bit bigger. Uh, and so anyway, or start using a slider where you tend to stay in there a little bit bigger. But the dial, sometimes I, I lose it. It's not the end of the world, though. Okay, so that's the noise equation. This one, we're also, um, we're in time, we are, we're going along. We're moving along the noise equation very quickly now. Here, we're moving along the noise equation very slowly. And here, we're not moving along the noise equation. So here's a bumpy, bumpy noise equation. And then this is how quickly we move along that noise equation. It can be much faster than that. Those are all considered dimensions within the noise. So we're, by default, just running, uh, I think it's a two-dimensional noise. No, there it is. So once we get the noise, then we ask for simplex 2D in this case. T is probably the time, and this is our bumpiness. So we're passing two parameters into our 2D noise and handling that. You can have noise as many as you want. But uh, if you go 3D, you can do either like blobs. 3D will make you blobs because it's kind of like a cross section of mountains. 3D will also get you mountains and you can change the mountains in time by going to 4D noise, et cetera, et cetera. You can have 1D noise, which is on a line. Um, okay, anyway, cool, huh? So we're uh, doing this in a ticker and the ticker is like our engine. You would have a rendering engine normally uh, we just have a ticker, so we have abstracted your render engine because we don't always need it. So we made the render, your render, your request animation frame, is automatically made in this call right here where we make the render, but you don't even see it here. So often if you want to animate something, you'll go to the render and animate something. Well, uh, I can't remember if we exposed that function in 3JS or in three the three module. We might have exposed the render so you could sort of access the function that it calls, but uh, we don't really bother because we're used to a ticker. So we just add this is a this is a, also a request animation frame, and it um, it's running at the frame rate. And so here you can add any function you want to the ticker. And it will only have one stage dot update. So that's like a queue, basically. And that avoids needing multiple uh, stage dot updates. Stage dot update is how we refresh our canvas. Anyway, that's all tied in with CreateJS, with the raycasting. Create, Zim is built on CreateJS, and that's where the stage dot update is happening. And what we've done with texture actives is in behind there. With our raycasting, we send the raycast data, the X and Y, right into the root of CreateJS. We take over the mouse pointers at that point, and we also automatically, on every stage.update, will update the, the canvas textures. Any texture active canvas gets its cache updated, otherwise it wouldn't change. And that's how we're bringing that canvas and changing that canvas. It's called the cache canvas. Uh, we're bringing that, changing that canvas, and uh, it's automatically updating on any stage that update. Okay, so we made that system all work for you, and you don't even have to think about it. Yay! Lots of claps. So based on what the slider's current value? Oh yes. Yeah, so this is how much we're changing time. So based on the slider's current value, those sliders will have. Uh, when we made the sliders, I don't know if we looked at it, but they have a minimum value of zero and a maximum of 0.3. That's this slider. This is the only slider. Okay, so that's changing your time. That's that's a very s slim slider. And there's, those are, that's the current value. What have we got for the step? The step is continuous, I guess. So we don't have any steps. It's just between these two values. <laughs> it's crazy with a step of 0 0.01. How does that work? 
The maximum is 0 0.03. Seems, this seems strange to me, doesn't it? Offset kind of does. The maximum is 0 0.03 with a step of 0 0.01. Isn't that only going to go 0, 0, 0.01, 0, 0.02 to 0, 0.03? That's strange because the slider should be sliding more than that. Certainly not ticking into any values. Uh, am I looking at the right stuff here? That's a current value. Oh, yes, I am looking at it. This is just a current value. That's not the step. So that's just saying start in, in not quite the middle. <laughs> okay, the middle would be one point or point zero one five. So this is going to, as we slide, uh, go to who knows, some decimal, big, huge decimal numbers. So it's basically saying start somewhere over there. There's our start. Here's zero. Here's 0 0.03. This is starting at 0 0.01. And then doing some decimal things to get us up to there. There's maximum. Do you want to see what that looks like really fast or even better hear what that looks like really fast? Why don't we go up to 0.1? That means that we're going to really step through the noise fast here. You ready? Bring up the sound. Make sure we're maximum. And are you ready? Wow, look at it go. All right, that was 0 0.01, but oh my goodness, my head is starting to explode. Oh no, don't do it to me. Could we go to one? What the heck would that be? That's like a thousand times bigger or a hundred times bigger. You ready? We don't have any sound going. <laughs> Look at that. Oh my God. Oh no, stop it. Okay, I can't take it anymore. Stop, stop, stop. Oh my goodness. Okay, don't do that. When I was developing the synthesizer, um, oh, it's so much fun because I play the Moog or the Moog and I love wah and I love, you know, I'm as, I was in a space rock band called the Gnostics and stuff and wore space helmets. But having this pumped into my headphones for hours and hours of testing, I started my body, my, my, my balance, my, oh, I was just, you know, I was getting queasy from it. It was like I was being uh, sonic experimented on, you know, I was like, oh, I can't stand it. So be careful as you play. Even just that is, is throwing me into remission and remembering those times. I've got, I'm queasy. Let's turn that off for revert. What was that? An undoozy. We better, <laughs> better undoozy that. <laughs> that wasn't that many. 0 0.3, 0 0.1. Okay, I think that's good. So we're talking down noise down here at the bottom. <laughs> I'm feeling totally dizzy. Noise at the bottom. Tickers, noise, right. So what we just changed there was the time, the slider's current value. So that meant uh, every time the ticker went, it went past, it went through that noise equation very, very quickly. That's obviously, it was very quickly. And the other one is how smooth it is. So we're setting the bar scale based on this noise amount to, uh, relative to some max scale, which sets somewhere, max scale of two. So we could play with that and get it to go, uh, if we put 10 there, then we would see that these these tubes would be quite long, I guess. There they are, quite long. Scale out. Oh, there's the speed of them. Come on. Wee. Have we got this set up so that it actually works by the number of these things? Well, let's drop that scale back again. To two. Where do we specify how many of these things we have? This is the test of how well we coded this thing, huh? Uh, 23 of them, please. Uh, give me 23. I want 23 of them. I demand 23 notes. Ooh, pretty. Does it still work? Where does it go to? Oh, that didn't. Okay, that one worked. Let's go to the live sound and see. It doesn't go beyond that. 
Okay, there would probably be a reason of some sort. We could certainly go beyond there. So it was a mini test of how well it was recorded. We got up to this far, but uh, for some reason we get... Oh yeah, I remember. We, we only had so many notes in our array. Uh, this will repeat itself just fine, but our array of notes right there ended ended here. We'd have to add more notes to, to handle that. That's pretty. We handled it from there. What about, can we do more? What did we set that at? This is, after all, is in Explore, isn't it? The num. <laughs> 223. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> is it actually, is it working or do we click off it like, I don't know, or is it just taking a long time to get there? It's probably taking a long time to get there. Here it comes. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Nice, huh? Just it's like the train, please call my note train. That would be really cool if the note actually did work on that, though, wouldn't it? It's like, oh, rainbow, my rainbow organ. All right, that's a big, huge piano that we got going on there. Very cool. And here's the speed of it pump, pity, pump, pity, pump. Slow it down, and whoa, yeah, there's the sort of the full scale of this thing so that's really noisy and make it even more noisy a bunch of noise okay we should turn this up <laughs> i don't know do you want that one on cosmic and there's smooth noise and go even smoother isn't that nice That's not going to, we're up too high for it to make a pitch change. We'd have to go, we'd have to strife way the heck down here. Uh, 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 uh. And we have to wait a little bit. Here it comes. And presumably, I'm not sure, but presumably down here. Set it live. Sorry. <laughs> okay, something nicer. <sighs> Isn't that cool? Can you imagine if we had the number of notes? We should probably... You don't need to use letters for notes. You can use numbers for notes. And that would have actually probably made it work without... Um, any adjustments. I like that. Alrighty, but let's uh, let's turn it off. <sighs> and undo. There's an undoozy. 13 was what we had? I think so. Alright, good. We're nearly there, huh? I think we might be there. That was a good little last explore. Uh, a treat for those of you who have lasted this long. That was all in the ticker, and we're setting it, the wah note, to, uh, yes, uh, whatever the bar's selected index, the height of it, I guess. So the val is how much that was at, I suppose. That was the height of it, in a sense, the val. And we're doing some magic to make it the wah note relate to that. I, mean, I don't know exactly what that was. Okay, so just some changes that. What is it? Handle volume changes as the camera gets closer or farther. Okay, so we've set up a proportion. This is a Zim proportion saying this is the base min and max from 0 to 400. Anytime you've got a proportion from 0 to 400 probably means it would have been a pretty easy calculation, but the proportion just maps some values. And basically, we're saying the base min is 0 to 400. So that's the camera. How far away is the camera from 0 to 400? And then the target that we're going to change is it's going to go from 2. 
So if we're zero, the biggest volume we're going to get is two. If we're 400 away, the smallest volume we're going to get is 0.1, and it will clamp it on those edges. You can also set the proportion to not clamped, but we want it clamped. So basically from zero to the camera of 400, we're going from a volume of two to a volume of 0.1. And then we're only checking that on an interval. We could put that in, the, in here, in the ticker, but we really don't need to uh, be changing the, we're ramping the volume. We don't need to ramp the volume 60 times per second. Okay, that possibly could be causing clicks or just, you know, it's just stressing it out a little bit. So every second we're ramping to whatever that is uh, giving us there. So if there's a tone and the tone is turned on, we're letting the volume be the proportion that we set up here, convert. So proportion.convert, whatever the camera's Z position is, if it's at zero, it'll be a volume of two. If it's at 400, it'll be a volume of 0.1. Anywhere in between here, if it's halfway, like at 200, it would be halfway between there, roughly one, I guess. All right, that's how proportion does. We also have proportion damp, which will uh, do that smoothly. It doesn't do it directly, but it sort of animates towards or animates the, the value towards something. I think they call that, uh, I've heard that called something else, a lerp. A lerp, in, if you work in uh, Unity, for instance, you're constantly lerping stuff. Anyway, that's where our proportion is doing that. We, we call it damping and possibly easing. Easing if it's in animation, damping if it's not. All right, there you go. And then our little thing there that if it was running at a slower frame rate, do, uh, do some like the first generation Galaxy tab or something, which seemed to kind of suck. Primarily because we're constantly caching all of our, our, our stuff and it just doesn't seem to do that very efficiently, but at 30 frames per second, it will do it just fine for you. Um, okay, uh, on a five-year-old iPad, uh, like an iPad Air 1 or something like that, it's smooth as butter, and obviously on computers, it's fine. The performance is quite nice, as you saw. Wow, wow, I say wow. I think this has just been a wonderful explorer, and if you like this, uh, come on out and join us at zimjs.com. So we'll go up to the top here. zimjs.com slash slack or zimjs.com slash discord right up here at the top. Okay, come on in, join us, right? Uh, I, I think it's certainly if you're coming from a 3JS world and yet you probably do some 2D stuff as well, uh, you might consider us for 2D work or bring, uh, you know, certainly for Texture Actives. I think that's very exciting now. And I think you'll save a lot of time and have a lot of opportunities. This, this to me, seems really, really new. I've been in VR for a, for a long time. I've wanted interactive walls there, and this will give me exactly what I want. So I can't wait to try this out in Banter, for instance, with 3JS and A-Frame. That's coming up. Uh, you know, I'll be doing some exploring with that throughout through you know the, the future. And I am Dr. Abstract. This has been a, a Zim Explorer. Ooh, and have a great day or night. Uh, it was really nice being here with you. Check out our next Explore as well, which is on the HUD, specifically on the HUD, and we'll dig into uh, more about that. And there's earlier Explores as well. Cheers. All the best. Ciao.